Good evening. It's an honor and a pleasure to see all of you today, and I'm feeling very lucky that we don't have 14 panelists up here tonight. Uh, one of the reasons why I was uh, very much looking forward to GTS is because the conversation about artificial intelligence has an element of a hype curve, but there is no question, even if you take that into account, that many, many lives around the world are going to be transformed and affected by artificial intelligence. If I think about the 1.4 billion people here in India, 1.3 billion people in Africa, people in North America, in Europe, in the Middle East, the questions we're going to take up today with a star-studded panel will be relevant to their lives and their children's lives. So uh, clearly, we have saved some of the best for last. And what better way to end the first day of the Global Technology Summit than with a panel with seven terrific panelists to talk about the future of artificial intelligence. Our goal is to take up two questions in particular that will be central to debates about AI in the years to come. First, how can countries prepare for a transition to a society and an economy more driven by artificial intelligence, more affected by its nuances, by its design? Second, how much can countries converge on how society, how the world should govern this technology? So without further ado, we're going to plunge in. We have, uh, in traditional Carnegie fashion, a set of panelists who represent different sectors, the public sector, the private sector, civil society, but also who have shown in their careers a commitment to a degree of intellectual honesty and curiosity. So let me start by asking each of them to start with maybe just two or three minutes of reflection on these questions, and in particular, what one or two issues they think are particularly important to the conversation about how countries can better prepare for an economy and society driven to a much greater extent by artificial intelligence. And Imran, since I have you right in front of me, I'm going to start with you. Thanks very much, Tino, and it's, uh, it's great to be here. Um, look, I start my remarks by saying that um, I don't think we should underplay the extent to which countries are already leaping forward to talk to each other about these issues. Um, I think we've seen that cooperation happening at the UN level. We've seen that happening through the global partnership on AI, through the G7, uh, and also, and you would expect me to say this, at the, the UK-hosted uh, AI Safety Summit. Uh, and I think one of the things we took away from the Safety Summit a few weeks ago um, was just, it was fantastic to have on the stage as part of the same panel, um, the US, India, China, the European Union, and to see that when you compare what each country is saying about responsible AI and the safe deployment of AI, there's remarkable similarity between the way that the countries are coming from. Now, there's a lot to do to follow that up. Um, there's a lot of conversations that we need to continue. Uh, but I think that level of convergence is very, very encouraging. Um, I think the second thing I would just add very quickly is I think what we noticed very much at the Safety Summit and a big focus of our work going forward with partners is the extent to which the science needs to keep developing as well. We're talking a lot about safe AI um, without yet, I think, having a sufficient understanding of what we mean by safe AI. Uh, there's a lot of work that still needs to be done at the scientific level about how do you evaluate AI models successfully and how do you then create the confidence that models that are deployed you can manage for dangerous capabilities as well as maximize for safe capabilities. Terrific, thank you. Eunice, your thoughts. Thanks, Thanks very much. I feel a little bit like Snow White and my seven male friends <laughs> <laughs> on stage. Um, I, I think this is a timely question. We, we just incidentally, as Google, um, put out a paper on the AI opportunity and how governments can can really build frameworks to seize the opportunity, right? So, so in, our, in our recommendation, we had three key pillars. The first pillar really is investing in AI infrastructure. Uh, and this means both hard infrastructure and soft infrastructure, right? So whether it's uh, on compute, uh, we've put out this idea that, you know, uh, you know we, we hear this every day that compute is, is a constraint, right? And that only uh, certain countries may have, uh, or certain companies may have access to compute. So how do we create a global AI resource uh, that, can be, that can be a way to share compute, for example, uh, with small businesses, with academics? Uh, how can companies come together, governments come together on that? The second one is really on uh, policy infrastructure, right? So how do you make sure that your copyright laws uh, are conducive 
to AI development? How do you ensure that your data governance laws uh, you know, promote safe and responsible AI? Uh, the, the second pillar that we, we talk a lot about also is about skilling. So how do you make sure that you have people uh, in your country who are AI ready, right? How do you build, build an AI ready workforce? How do you skill them? How do you work uh, with private companies and public sectors and universities to make sure that uh, you know, people have the right access to AI training, uh, whether it's online training or in-person training? How do you make sure that uh, the workforce, you know, there will be disruption. How do you make sure that you catch the people who will be disrupted because of AI and reskill them, right? In, in Singapore, we like to use the term a trampoline. It's not a safety net, it's a trampoline. You catch the person who falls and help the person move up even higher. Um, and then th the third pillar is really about promoting wide uh, spread adoption of AI. So how do we do that? I think what we heard just now about uh, you know, uh, the DPI really is a really good example. How does government lead a way in, in producing very useful use cases that are very tangible to the everyday person, right? They can see how it helps with diagnosis of health conditions. They can see how it helps with climate. So these three pillars, I think, you know, set a good framework when thinking about how governments can help promote AI adoption, AI development in their societies. Thank you, Eunice, and on behalf of Carnegie, I promise we'll never make you feel like Snow White again. <laughs> that's okay, she's a heroine, so. <laughs> that's true, that's fair. Abhishek, you sit in a very crucial role, a place, both with respect to the Indian government and the Global Partnership on AI. What should the world be thinking about to prepare for this transition? See, like, uh, as, uh, as just been mentioned, like, uh, we are at a stage in the evolution of technology wherein we have we see ai as a as a as a great opportunity for leapfrogging from the solutions we have made to making much better solutions which can impact population at uh, people at a large scale so how do we ensure that we provide access to healthcare solutions for farmers or for every other sector how can ai solution be designed to do that and while doing so how do we address the issues of safety and trust how do we ensure that user harm doesn't happen and while doing so you have to think of building up a framework in which we are able to balance between innovation and regulation. And while doing so, do not go in such a great extent of regulating that we kill innovation. And while do, we do that, the other issue that comes in, especially when governments, there are always a desire to regulate more and more. But when are wanting to regulate, how do we build in the capacity for regulating the right things and ensuring that we promote the innovative things there? So that would require more global power cooperation. There are countries which are much higher in the AI race. How can we learn from them? How can we share what can be done at a population scale in a country like India? Because the amount of data sets that we have is much more than any other country. So any model which is built and deployed in India and measures on the, on the parameters of safety, trust, responsibility, ethics will largely be expected to work elsewhere also. So India can become a test bed for deploying solutions in uh, India's uh, responsible AI framework. And if any solution is there to detect diseases or to help agriculture or farmers, that can be of great use elsewhere. The other key thing that we need to, especially a country like India, which has a huge IT workforce, is that how does it impact jobs? How do we look at future of work? How do we look at AI skilling? And very often I heard somewhere that AI doesn't kill jobs. Not having AI skills will kill jobs. So having a, a, a way of Skilling, upskilling, reskilling, in order to ensure we are able to take this advantage will be a very, very important issue. Many of these issues will be deliberated in the GPA summit that we are hosting. And we will, And uh, what is also interesting is that uh, the G7 Hiroshima process or the G20 declaration or the uh, US guidelines or the, uh, the UK's AI safety summit at Bletchley Park, all of them have, there are certain common elements. We need to bring all of these together and try to ensure that under the umbrella of GPA, or any other international framework, UN is also coming up with the advisory body and all. We come out with an international consensus with regard to how we will regulate AI and how the big tech will start complying with what the international com community is deciding. Because it cannot just be that any country lays down directions, but one will have to also ensure that whatever directions are being done are complied with. So that building capacity within and building capacity in collaboration with the global partners will become very, very key. Great. Uh, since Abhishek mentioned labor markets and skills, Eric, I want to go to you, and you're welcome to share any thoughts you have, but certainly I know you and your colleagues have been working on some interesting things that get at this question of like, 
How can the world reskill and prepare for a set of conditions that might require very different um, job market um, approaches? Great. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll get to the skills part. I, I do want to build on this important point that's been raised a couple of times of use cases, because I do think it's such a powerful part of the conversation that is emerging more and more in recent weeks. I, it felt for the first few months this year, there was, for very good reason, a lot of focus on uh, the societal impact of foundation models. And that is, of course, an important element, of course, a great focus of the safety summit. Uh, but the way in which a lot of people are actually going to experience AI and use it is going to be through enterprise use cases. And it's going to be through brands, in fact, whether it is their interactions with financial services or healthcare or consumer goods or automotive. Uh, and so there's this really important element here that we want to bring to the forefront of you know, how, how will AI impact people, but how will AI impact industries uh, and then their interactions with people. That also has an important layer that ties into the different responsibility elements we talked about with AI because all of these enterprises, all of these brands have a built-in necessity to be safe, to be secure, to be accurate, to be responsible. So this, this is certainly critical. On, on skilling, um, we are very committed to this. And again, there is a, a symbiotic relationship between the desire to increase the skills, the AI readiness that people have, as well as to support the services we have. We've seen here in, in India an amazing capacity and interest to utilize the, the free skilling programs that we have, where we had expected that in this past year we were going to have about 500,000 people trained and it was about 3 million. So the appetite is there, the capacity is there, and the opportunity and need is there. Terrific. Seth, you've been in the middle of a whole bunch of discussions involving how countries are looking at the future on AI. What should countries do to prepare? I think there is actually an emerging consensus, at least at the level of principle. Abhishek, you mentioned finding the balance between innovation and regulation. Obviously, I think all of us here agree there has to be a balance between seizing opportunity and managing risk. And if I could just speak for a couple minutes about the approach that the United States has taken, I think it's instructive both for uh, the kinds of evolution that we've gone through at home, and perhaps it might offer some lessons abroad. The first is the necessity for breadth in thinking about governance, and the second is the urgency around depth of governance. The necessity of breadth really is captured by the fact that as the Vice President has said, we're talking about a ubiquitous general purpose technology that represents a full spectrum of possible risks from bias and discrimination all the way up to those that consume many who have been developing AI for many years. We have to take that into account. And actually this discussion and the evolution of the policy in the United States did not begin with uh, ChatGPT. There's been several years of efforts to develop a breadth of approaches to developing responsible AI, uh, char characterized by two major documents. One, the AI Bill of Rights, and the second being the, uh, the NIST Risk Management Framework, both of which capture an underlying foundational effort, uh, consensus-driven, to build a framework for dealing with these issues. Those then were translated in the era of uh, foundation models into the EO, which has been uh, noted to be uh, most important for its long length, 111 pages, but it captures the construct, I think, that could apply broadly. That is, you need safe and secure AI, you need to balance innovation and competition in any public policy choices. You need to have public policy in place that supports workers, that advan advances equity and civil rights, that confronts issues of privacy, that protects consumers, and that of course ensures that as governments themselves apply AI, it's done in the most responsible ways as a model for societies. The issue of depth, the second issue, is one that we confronted much, with much more urgency with the, um, with the development of foundation models and the realization that they're going to scale quickly, that they're going to be emergent capabilities, that there are going to be a series of risks that we don't yet fully understand, but we know they're coming online quickly. And here we recognize quite quickly that governments, ours in particular, but others as well, are not well prepared to manage 
these foundation models. And we had to work in partnership with the multi-stakeholder community and also with the companies developing them to understand what is required uh, to manage risk. Things like red teaming, third-party validation and testing, disclosure and information sharing. These basic technical criteria that you would want to apply rapidly as these systems come online. And so as we move forward, I think if you take the breadth and depth issues together, it provides a, a broad framework in which I think any government could probably work through these challenges, even if they're gonna adapt them to their particular legal and executive requirements. Seth, if I could follow up briefly, the US executive order on AI, how long is that? Well, it depends on the font size, Tina. <laughs> It's, it's 111 pages, okay, and, and, and it covers the breadth of issues. I hear you, and I guess I would note a number of countries are represented in the audience, and if somebody walked up to you and said, like, well, you know, a lot of us are watching what the U.S. does. Does my country need a 111-page document? What would you say? I would go back to the eight principles that organize the document. Do you want safe and secure AI? Do you want to protect workers? Do you want to protect civil liberties and civil rights? Do you want to protect consumers? Do you have a framework for government use? And if the answer is yes, you want all those things, then it's worth at least skimming the document or running it through one of the large language models to synthesize it for you. <laughs> Thank you, very helpful. Ashtosh, let me go to you. What do you think is crucial at this moment? Yeah, thanks. Um, so I look at it as a three-bucketed problem, and I got an acronym for it, uh, which is basically TAP. So you need to build trust, you need to drive accessibility, and you need to have the policy frameworks to actually support that. So when I look at trust, I'm looking at it from various angles. The first is the fact that you need to build the trust and confidence in people that what they're using will really give them good results. You've got to build the trust in enterprises when they're using uh, uh, technology, AI technology, that it won't, it won't take them down the wrong road, right? That manifests itself in a lot of things, which is capacity building, education, how do you use AI properly, the responsible user of AI, et cetera. The second part is when I talk about access, is it, it's all about making sure that it's completely inclusive and it's available to all. You cannot have, and we were having this conversation this morning, you can't have data sets which exclude a large part of the world. You can't have access to this technology only reflected in a few parts of the world. It needs to be made available to everyone, irrespective of the geography, irrespective of your, uh, where you're coming from. And then you need to have those policy frameworks which you need to build upon and help take this to fruition. We are seeing a lot of conversations across the world, stuff that's happened in the United Kingdom, European Union, uh, what's happening in Washington DC, uh, what came out of G7. And I think there's an important need to look at the fact that we possibly don't need completely new regulations, but we need frameworks which guide principles for people, organizations, both the developers, the deployers, and the users to follow. Which means that you, you, you kind of look at what are the risks that want, you need to control because you don't need to control all the issues. You need to look at a risk-based framework. You need to look at a framework which makes sure that the human is at the center of it all. And so it's human-centric and the human is in control. You can't let it run away on its own. And finally, I would say, uh, you, you would need to ensure that these things are globally coherent. And, and the reason why I lay emphasis on globally coherent is that, uh, and we were just having this discussion just before the session started, that if we don't have globally coherent, harmonized norms, we will have the chance of bad actors leveraging policy gaps or regulatory gaps and actually using it in, incorrectly which will then strike, go back down and strike the trust factor that you wanted to build. So I take Thank you. Actually, the reference to some degree of coherence brings to mind the European Union, which is in the middle of a process of trying to achieve that. So Stefan, share with us your perspective, both about what you think is most important and how that process is going. Yes, I think most important is we have indeed a uh, huge acceleration of AI development in the last months and therefore it's our task, also the task of governments that uh, we can fully explore the chances, uh, the possibilities of advanced AI 
This can revolutionize uh, a lot of fields of all our life, and therefore it's our task to enable this uh, development in the future. This is not only an opportunity, I think this is a necessity for all of us. And the responsible AI development combined with uh, global co collaboration, this was mentioned uh, before, and this is extremely important as we work together here worldwide in this field, enables us uh, to utilize uh, the immense benefits of AI while ensuring safety and uh, security. To maximize uh, the benefits of AI, uh, we will, among many other things, uh, we have to invest in research and uh, development as well as in education and in qualification of uh, our people. We have to cooperate internationally and across all sectors. We have to establish ethical standards, as you mentioned before. We have to build trust and acceptance um, in this uh, technology. We have to consider the aspect of sustainability and provide an inclusive access, this was also mentioned before, uh, to the AI technology. The perspective of the German government and the perspective of the European Union is that we need an innovation-friendly regulation framework for AI. It's uh, indeed a new technology and therefore it makes no sense to regulate it, it in every detail we need this innovation-friendly uh, um, environment and we need uh, a balance between the possibilities and potential risks of AI. And in the dynamic landscape that we have in the international AI governance, I wish to emphasize uh, three key elements that are relevant for me at the moment. First, that new international initiatives and uh, mentioned uh, the G7, the GPAI, uh, the UN uh, activities in the field of AI, that these new international initiatives must be integrated meaningfully and sustainably, and we have to avoid uh, redundancy. This makes no sense if we have different uh, regulation. Second, we must consider a broad spectrum of AI risks while not losing uh, the sight of the immense opportunities, as I mentioned before. And third, a multi-stakeholder approach is extremely uh, um, essential in developing AI policies. So government, uh, companies, and uh, academia has to work, in, in the civil society has to work here together to find the best solutions. So um, it's indeed a lot of things to do, but let us start with uh, um, minimal regulation at the beginning, with code of conduct, with self-regulation, and then step by step, we can uh, continue the regulation, but not at the beginning to uh, enable AI to fulfill its full potential in the future. So I wanna ask a question that will get you all in conversation with each other, but I wanna set it up by first noting some things I'm hearing from you all. If we go to a level of 40 or 50,000 feet, I hear agreement about the importance of taking account risks, but also benefits. If I go a little lower, closer to the ground, maybe 20,000 feet, I hear a recognition that some beneficial applications that are very practical could be developed and implemented in emerging powers around the world, some of them dealing with detecting sepsis, for example, or improving agriculture, or improving education. I also hear a sense that on the risk side, there are national and supranational projects that will get us to better and more testing before models are deployed. But I wanna ask you what the world looks like if I go down from 20,000 feet to 1,000 feet. And that leads us to what I think is important and maybe sounds strange from the perspective of an organization like mine that is designed to try to bridge divides and create agreement. And that is, to be honest, given the quality of the panel we have, of where you see the fault lines, the disagreements, where you see the fissures that might make these questions about the future of AI difficult to resolve, perhaps even toxic and by being honest about those divides, we can perhaps see where you would put the thumb on the scale and how you hope to see them resolved. But I want to ask you to first maybe lay out where you see those fissures and divides uh, and how we can be honest about them. Go for it, Seth. I'll, I'll be brave and take on the first, <clears throat> the first stab at this. I think... 
one place where we have not yet confronted the real challenge that will emerge as we descend towards uh, beyond low Earth orbit is um, when we get to the question of risk in the context not of broad concerns in the abstract, but ones that may touch on national security equities. At that point, the kinds of um, global cooperative dynamics become much harder to work through. So for instance, if you wanted to talk about transparency and red teaming for a particular kind of national security risk, it has a whole series of implications about who would have access to a system, what would be revealed under what circumstances, which may not actually be as easy to, uh, to globalize. Uh, on the other hand, um, there's a whole other series of risks around misuse and accidents that you would want to avoid, which very much should be part of a global conversation. So I would anticipate that being one place where we'll have to have a little more friction going forward. Terrific. Stefan and then Ashtosh. Yes, I think uh, in, with this, within this emerging technology, it's so important that we uh, observe the development in the future. So what happened? And uh, therefore, as I mentioned before, if we have a too strict regulation on AI, so what is allowed, what is not allowed, you can use every technology uh, for good purpose and for other purpose. Yeah? So uh, before we know this, we have, to do, we have to observe the development and know uh, legal regulation on detail. Therefore, it is more helpful if we have uh, self-regulation by the companies. The companies, big companies, have no interest to develop AI uh, with a bad purpose. Yeah, I don't think so. And therefore, I think that the self-regulation is the best way. And if there is a development in the wrong direction, you can act directly and you can uh, uh, combine the self-regulation with uh, new uh, uh, a precondition that AI has to fulfill. Transparency was mentioned a lot of time before, perhaps other uh, issues that we have to address, but we don't know it at moment, and therefore uh, we can uh, uh, put a lot of theoretical questions on the table, but this is not helpful for us at the moment. We have to go step by step. We haven't the one-fits-all solution directly, and therefore let us go step by step in this development, with a flexible mechanism, and a flexible mechanism is self-regulation, is a code of conduct that you can change very soon. And just to follow up on that, because it's a framework that is coherent, just to say, you would imagine that the private sector could self-regulate up to a point, maybe audited or verified in some way to make sure that they're complying with what they're promising. And what might make you think that that system is not working and then requires something different? I think, therefore, only, only a self-regulation by the companies is not helpful. Therefore, we need uh, some guidelines. We need some guardrails. And this is what, the G, what for example, G, the G7 has developed this year, what the OECD has developed. Yeah? So, and this is the basis for a self-regulation. And the authorities, the state authorities, have to control if the companies fulfill this self-regulation. So it's a little bit difficult word, but it's uh, at the end a regulated self-regulation. Yeah, so that you have something like an instrument if the companies do not fulfill what they uh, uh, print out in their self-regulation. Yeah. Regulated self-regulation sounds like a good prompt for a large language model. We'll come back to okay. that. Ashtash. Yeah, so I think uh, one of the first areas is going to be, which I see cross-purposes happening, is around the area of ethics. What's, what, what's ethical? And, and that could be different depending upon various cultural nuances, which is why one needs to look at frameworks or risk-based frameworks and the issue of harm. So you can you know, balance it out with what the harm is. That's one, one area. The second thing is uh, when we ultimately look at compliance, and the liabilities behind that compliance, that's another area possibly where you can see a, a divergence of views across geographies and across territories. And finally, you know, what Seth was talking about, uh, and which is there also in the, uh, the Washington DC document, is about when companies or organizations who are using or developing AI solutions have to declare the possible harms and the possible issues that come out of it, there could be situations where companies are hesitant to talk about it or, and or even nation states 
are hesitant if their companies talk about those possible harms coming out of those solutions for various reasons, which is why the auditing process that you talked about is going to be extremely important. Thank you for the candor. And I'll just note that for those of us who have followed the development of cybersecurity issues, this has been a challenge, right? Like there's often a collective action problem around getting honest information reported that somehow doesn't trigger more ransomware attacks, but that can give the public a, an accurate picture of what the, what the problem is. Abhishek, I saw you making stirrings as a possible you know, comment. Yeah, yeah. in fact, I was, um, the question is very interesting. Like, while at the 40,000 feet level, there's uh, talk of collaboration, having common framework, guidelines for innovation, balancing it with regulations. But when you come down, when you come down to the ground and brass tacks, start thinking of what we are going to do, how we are going to, what, how are we going to actually solve and build AI model. The first thing that strikes is, okay, where is the equitable access to compute data sets or algorithms? Okay, like the biggest problem that all of us are facing, the researchers, startups, is that compute is limited. It's there with a few, few companies and a few countries. To right now, the, the supply chain gaps that are there in getting H100s or uh, A100s also is huge. And the other companies are still catching up. So to get access to compute for all countries is going to be very, very challenging. And how do we build a framework in which everybody gets through? Can we think of building a CERN for AI? Some compute facility within uh, global co community comes together. And any researcher, whichever part of the world he is in, if he wants to use that compute, can he get access to that? Can the global community think of building that? Then when we come to data sets, how do we ensure uh, sharing of data sets across geographies? All kinds of regulations, national sovereign laws, policies, they come in. Okay, like even if there is a sovereign, uh, there is a framework for sharing anonymized data across geographies. But then also the question will come, if the data set of a particular country is used to develop an algorithm or build an AI model, who has the IP over it? Will the country from where the data sets have come in or will the country where the model has been developed? Then again, when you look at IP, the whole issue of open models and the closed models comes in. Okay, like, where, 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 what are the policies for developing them? And when we come this, the, the real skirmishes and the real difference of opinions and real negotiations start, uh, start happening. And then when we come to issues of talent, okay, like, uh, how do we ensure that the countries which have, which have a greater strength in building, writing code or building AI models, they also have a pie in the game? Or is it only countries which have access to, which have uh, the advantages of building the compute infrastructure? So all these issues of uh, access when we talk about and trying to balance it out, the, uh, the compute algorithms or, uh, or the data sets issues, the real issues of uh, actual solving the problems in various countries will come in. So right now, all forums are talking at a very high level. So when we actually get to operationalize the agreements that are there, all these issues will also need to be addressed. And we will need to come out with some models in which there are models, the IPCC model or the modern models which have led to solving other global challenges in climate change or the you know, IAEA model for there. So we can think of, can we borrow from some of the existing models in order to create a framework which actually allows us to focus more on developing solutions and uh, working in actual collaboration with each other. Terrific. There's something you said that makes me want to ask Eunice a quick follow-up question, and that is, you talked about a world where uh, there is an infrastructure that allows many researchers in many countries to have access to compute. Now, Eunice, you called for something that maybe you didn't use exact same words, but sounded similar for public investment in infrastructure. And I would just note that perhaps some observers might be surprised by that because they might think that larger companies that already have access to this would be perfectly happy to let that access to stay with them and have the world come to them for various services that AI can provide. But you took a different line and just wanted to hear a little bit more about why. Yeah, actually, I mean, I think that's a misconception. Google gives compute credits to many academic institutions, researchers. Uh, you know, they have access to compute. We give them compute hours. Um, a lot of, I think that the DNA in Google is really about open sharing. I mean, the transformer technology that that basically spurred LLMs, right? What you see on generative AI was from a Google paper that we, we published in, in 2016. Um, so <clears throat> I think the idea really about this global resource uh, on, on AI research, uh, it, it's really like what Abhishek said, can we create a CERN global CERN for AI, right? Can we, can we pull compute resources? Can we pull um, 
<clears throat> skilling programs for for uh, you know people all in one one space, uh, so that you know we we make AI more accessible, more equitable, uh, and that we can have startups growing right because they have access to this kind of resources. So so I think I think on the contrary, that the DNA of of Google has always been very open. And then just the broader question of where you think the disagreements are in the general space we're in. Yeah, I was going to add one more thing to to that list uh, of of potential fault lines, and this really comes from my my past life as a, a trade negotiator, which is really about <clears throat> um, discrimination, right? So so I have my own AI model. You know, the U.S. has its own, Germany has its own. You know, Korea has its own, China has its own, and to to gain access to my market, right? You have to open up and show me your algorithms, right? That there are trade rules on this that, you know, that sort of access to algorithms should not be a condition for market access. So I think this kind of issues may also pop up where countries try to erect barriers uh, to protect domestic companies. Uh, so, so I think just, just putting one more potential fault line out there that, that could arise. Emran. So I think of each of the, the altitudes that you described, I think one thing that is very obvious is you see competition. Um, and so whether, you know, those of us that are sitting here talking on behalf of governments or those who are here talking on behalf of companies, there's competition between governments and there's competition between companies. But it's then interesting to look at kind of what are the dimensions in which competition is manifesting itself. It's, we all want to be the first in terms of achieving the benefits and we all want to be the last in terms of manifesting the risks. Uh, I think that's a win-win situation, right? Because um, it means that when it comes to risk, I think, especially countries perhaps, uh, are trying to strike that balance and trying to quite carefully strike that balance between addressing public concern about risk as well as kind of real substantive issues about risk, but doing so in a way that continues to create benefits. I actually think some of the issues on generating benefits between countries are gonna be the most challenging for countries to deal with. Um, because there's a lot of things that governments need to get right in order to ensure that the benefits are delivered for our citizens. There's lots of quite complicated things about data governance, uh, as well as, as what we were hearing in the previous keynote about data creation. Um, that historically has been quite a difficult thing for governments to get right. Um, so there being a bit of competitive tension between governments on getting that right is probably no bad thing. Uh, and what I'm noticing a lot in government-to-government -government conversations is we're comparing notes and we're trying to boast to each other about what we're doing on that. And again, that's a, I think that's a good dimension in which to have competition. Uh, I agree with the comments that have been made about the competition that's emerging on compute. I think if we continue to manage that in a way that ensures there's broad access to compute, I think European Union is doing that through the HPC network. We've been doing that through the investments in the UK that we're making in uh, research resources, uh, supercomputers for AI, the same as the, the EU. So again, I'm hopeful that in the way in which we manage for the benefits, the competition actually delivers good things. Um, but I think when you read a lot of the reporting around this, the competition gets talked about a lot, uh, gets observed a lot. And I think it's just worth getting a layer underneath that and saying, what are the negative effects of this competition? Whereas I think there could be a lot of positive effects of the competition. So to say, say just a touch more, Imran, about those negative effects. So what is the kind of competitive dynamic that you think would not be helpful? So again, look, this is something that's been commented on a lot. Are there companies, for example, in their development of AI models who are racing so fast to get a model out that as a consequence of that, they're not observing the right protocols about safety or the right protocols about red teaming? I think that is something now that uh, companies are putting a lot more focus on. I think that is something that we as governments, individually and collectively, are putting a lot more focus on. It started with the voluntary commitments made at the White House by a set of companies. We continued that theme through into the UK AI Safety Summit. I know it's a big feature of other international conversations about this as well. And I've got to say, even in the time that I've been part of this conversation, I'm seeing that conversation moving a lot in terms of the companies. Uh, maturing a lot, I'm seeing the companies invest a lot more in safety. Uh, not saying the problem is solved, um, um, but I feel like we're moving in the right direction. Thank you. Eric, your thoughts? I mean, one of the 
things to keep in mind to your question about fault lines. There can be structural fault lines, there can be accidental fault lines. And a very important part of the work that we need to do as we move from this higher level of abstraction of principles to the more detailed implementation of these principles is to pay attention to consistency in how we do that as well. And that gets very hard, not only across jurisdictions, but even within jurisdictions. If I think even with the process that uh, the OMB will oversee pursuant to the executive order of each agency, determining what are going to be the requirements for procurement, there's gonna be a very important coordination effort so that we don't have definitions of what does you know, toxicity detection, bias detection, uh, red teaming look like. So it's really a call uh, against uh, um, accidental fault lines that this incredible spirit of collaboration that's happening now is actually going to have to redouble or triple as we get further into detail. The um, operational consequences of inconsistency are actually consequential as you try to do something that can address the concerns that are consistently being identified, but able to do it at, at a scale. So I want to uh, maybe build on the discussion about what might be tricky, what divides might be difficult to bridge by bringing up the open source question. Throughout the day, many discussions of AI and some discussions of digital public infrastructure have noted that the world can benefit and has benefited and is benefiting from open source models. They have certain properties. They allow adaptation and fine tuning. They allow some jurisdictions that are not able to train their own models to benefit from these innovations. By the same token, I wanna maybe invite you to reflect a little bit on whether you could imagine a situation where the technology advances to a degree that you would be a little worried about something going open source. I'm not necessarily talking about technology that is at the current state of development, but our responsibility here at GTS is not just to think about the present, but the future. So if you look two or three years ahead and you imagine models that are 100 or even 1,000 times more um, compute intensive with many more capabilities at current models, would that give you pause about the open source dimension? And, uh, and what in general do you think the world should do to bridge those divides? Who's going to be brave? Let me be brave. Thank you. OK. All right. So I, I think you, you pose a very interesting question. But I don't think so. the issue is about open source or uh, proprietary. Because you, you're talking about the concerns of someone or some organization or some nation state using a model for improper usage. And I think that's where the entire governance framework, the risk-based mechanism, and what do you use it for, the usage model issue comes into the picture. So if something can be used for good or it can be used for bad, then we need to be sure that whether it's open sourced or it's proprietary, it doesn't get into that dream. Or if it does get into that dream, there are controls which are around that. Yes, there is that concern sometimes that, uh, you know, something which is open source can go, can, can go rogue. But then I, don't, I think proprietary also has the same concerns. You can always build on top of it, right? So I think the question, I'm not saying the question is wrong. It's a correct question to ask. But then it comes back to the framework of what are the guardrails that we are building in place for, for, for organizations? Just, just shooting off the hip. I take your point. And part of what I'm hearing from you is that you recognize the concern, but you'd like there to be a different way of just detecting improper use That's and right. responding to That's it. Right. I would note that one of the challenges technically might be whether it's possible to have an open source model where the guardrails cannot be stripped away. And that we, is, a, is a challenge. It's a challenge. But it's a question that we need to answer. The thing is that if we clamp down on open source right now, then you're possibly also clamping down on innovation. So you need to do that balance. Other thoughts about this? Abhishek? I would say like uh, agree to what Ashutosh said, but I would just like to add that uh, that uh, open source also gives you an opportunity for detecting the possibilities of any wrong that's going on. You know, once you're proprietary, then very often many people will not even know how the algorithm is working, what it is doing. The whole issue explainable AI also comes in. 
So in open source, once you are opening it up for the community and for the developers, everyone to see, they're able to see that. So there is a greater community check with regard to what the uh, model is doing, is actually doing the same or doing anything different. So to that point, I would feel that, uh, again, my personal opinion is that open source models would anyway score much better than proprietary models because uh, sometimes proprietary models may be built on such kind of algorithms and, co and compute that even the regulators or anyone trying to make sense of what it's doing might feel um, there might be a challenge to doing that. Okay. Emran? The focus on capabilities is the right focus rather than on open versus proprietary. Um, I think that being said, I think if we start to see capabilities emerge um, that give us real cause for concern or cause for pause, um, then I think at that point you do have to look at what are the right protocols to have in place. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean stopping open source development, but it might be reflecting on whether we've got the right protocols in place at the right stage in development in order to manage for dangerous capabilities. Um, so I think capabilities remains the right focus. But I think alongside it, the other thing that's really important is to keep working the science of this. I mean, you mentioned in your question that, um, I mean, I think we know there are models being trained on uh, with far more compute and far more data than the current generation of models. If that's 100 times more, does that mean that those models are going to have 100 times the capability? Um, that's a different question. And what might the new capabilities be or what might the dangerous capabilities be? That's something that we still need to do a lot more scientific work on. And I think that's why it's really important that both at the company level and at the government level, we really invest in that scientific capability. Point taken, and you know, to just expand on your point, the nonlinear nature of the relationship between the amount of compute and training and functionality and capability emergence in both directions, right? There could be some diminishing returns, but also some emergent capabilities makes it a hard question to answer. And I note that, Seth, in the executive order, there was a, an acknowledgement, let's put it that way, that there's additional work to be done in identifying capability thresholds, right? Anything you want to say on that score? I think that's exactly exactly the challenge. Uh, the executive order creates a compute threshold, which I think most people acknowledge will probably not ultimately be the threshold. The threshold, but in the absence of something more clear right now, and the lack of clarity is captured in the discussion we're having right now, we have to move. We have to move towards as sound of a public policy framework as we can as quickly as possible. And so this is one of those unusual moments when um, public policy is being made with full acknowledgement that it's only a very initial step and will have to be recalibrated probably very soon. I'm going to make two brief observations about what I've heard from you in the last round, and then I want to do a lightning round asking you to just uh, share a closing reflection. One, it's very clear that we are acknowledging the critical role of the private sector here. The private sector is both the hub of the frontier development, but also a place of great expertise. And in many respects, um, gives good examples of wanting to do responsible, thoughtful things. Two, though, there is a, a recognition of a need to sort of trust but verify and have a framework, whether through audits or something comparable that allows for enough clarity and transparency on how it's going that whether at the domestic level or at the international level, there's some way to react effectively if there's a real deviation from what would be maybe the on the equilibrium path behavior. I want you to just take a moment to just quickly imagine the AI future you would most like to see in five years and say just a brief 20, 30 seconds about it and what you would identify as the biggest impediment to realizing that future. Eric, since I gave you the chance to, to, to speak last first, now you get to speak first, last. Well, you know, I'm actually going to reflect on process rather than outcome here. And it's, it is, a, it is a, a lot of gratitude to the public officials for the process and the progress with how we're approaching this. Because it, it feels so different to me from so many things I've worked on over the years going back to how complex global issues were negotiated. Uh, you know, for, for, for trade in the 90s or, or onwards. We're in a very fast-moving situation here, and there is a willingness uh, to work together and to know we do not have all the answers 
And rather than trying to do nothing until we can do everything, but to be very explicit and say, someone's going to take a step, someone's going to iterate on that and build on it. We're going to acknowledge straight out that this is not done. And so my process point is that I hope that this continues. I hope that this is a new uh, way of actually working together collaboratively in a multi-stakeholder way on fast-moving issues with um, humility and openness and a, a deep desire to make the steps where we can and to course correct when we find we need to. Imran? So you said five years, so I'll go for quite a big one, uh, which is there's a lot said and written about how AI is the spur for the next industrial revolution. If anything like that is true, then I think we should reflect on the fact that previous industrial revolutions, the gains of those have not been shared equitably between countries or within countries. Um, can we do a better job with this one? I think that's my hope. Uh, and I think that's a real, that should be a real focus for how we think about the governance of this together. Thank you, Eunice. I think the thing that gets me most excited about AI are the use cases and the applications, right? When you think about something like AlphaFold, and you know, um, you know, folding proteins in a year, 200 million proteins in a year in what would have taken 1 billion human hours, it's science at digital speed, right? So the, the, what it opens up in terms of uh, you know, personalized medicine, how it can cure cancer, you know, things like that. I think you know, in five years time, I really hope to see you know, many, many, many different research applications, use cases built on top of all this kind of very basic scientific discovery that AI is able to enable. So I think what, we, we, what I fear is um, regulation that is not based on scientific rigor. Uh, and sort of technical uh, understanding of, of, of how the technology works. So, you know, ensuring that that balance between innovation and regulation is, is there and it's enabling instead of, of constraining. Thank you. Abhishek? Yeah, I would, say, uh, I would say five years is a bit long when you look at the pace at which this technology is evolving. But yes, if I have to say what we will do, like one thing that will revolutionize is like, the interface between the communications between people across the world will become speech oriented and people will be able to speak any language, communicate with anyone. So the whole issue of language barriers may be breached in the next few years. We are seeing that already happening in India and we feel that will happen globally. And more advances, I agree with what Yunus said about use of AI for innovating in solving key healthcare problems in gene design, drug design. So drug development, all of it will transform the way we live our lives. So that was there. The risk I feel is that uh, the biggest risk is that we may keep on going this debate of innovation regulation and it should, if it's not globalized, if we don't come out with a framework, the technology may get limited to a few uh, companies or a few countries and then we will not be able to leverage the potential advantages that we have. Thank you. Seth. I'm actually not sure that anybody could have framed it better than uh, Eunice did. I mean, this is uh, in five years, an accelerated scientific revolution that spurs advances in everything from health, health to material science, uh, solving all 16 SDGs uh, without somehow also turning this into the kind of national security concern that is animating many of these conferences. Fair enough. Yes, I think AI will help us uh, in five years uh, to solve a lot of problems that uh, our societies and our communities have. My wish is uh, that in five years we have uh, concrete standards, that we have certificates, uh, that we have more transparency about AI, so that the user of AI knows, like for example, the CE sign in, that we have in uh, Europe, yeah? you know, okay, this product uh, has a CE sign, it fulfills the requirements uh, that we have, yeah? And uh, in this field, that we have transparency, non-discriminatory, that we have uh, uh, um, a big data um, uh, basis for this AI, non-discriminatory. So that the user knows uh, when he uses an application, okay, AI is inside, and this AI has a certificate. Yeah? And therefore, and this uh, is the beginning, this work is beginning worldwide uh, to work out standards and certificates for AI. I think this is very, very um, uh, um, helpful to use AI in the future. Thank you. Ashutosh, you get the last word and you have 44 seconds. All right. So I look at social equity, 
human well-being, a healthier planet. These are the three goals that I'd look at. And the only thing that I think that will prevent us from doing that is if we very quickly don't come down from 45,000 feet to 1,000 feet and get agreement. Thank you. That will be one of our themes. In about 20 seconds, I'm going to ask you to clap, and I would like you to clap for three groups. Not yet, not yet. One is for this panel. Two is for the Carnegie India team for putting together a great first night, from my perspective. And three is for all of you for sticking with us until the end. Thank you.